Um, I'm the worst at, uh, at, at selling myself and, and my wares. So, um, so when I say that it's going to be an, an Eisner nominated book, uh, it's, it's killing me just to say it. Hey, welcome. Today's guest is Jason Copeland, and I'm really excited to share our talk. Um, I don't usually do a sort of a call a crash minute episode, but Jason and I had been talking for a while and wanted to do a show together. And his campaign is starting up for full tilt very soon. And I didn't, it, it wouldn't come out in time with my current schedule of doing every other week with new new shows. So I pushed some already recorded episodes back and uh, Jason and I recorded. This would be yesterday when you're hearing it today. And uh, so I figured I just got to all cram it all in together. So um, yeah, I, the every other week thing is a necessity because the, rewrite for the book is in full swing. And uh, I think, yeah, I'm well into the third act by the time you listen to this. Um, what did I say the other day? Something, some ridiculous sum of, uh, yeah, 160,000 words. And I have a bit more to go, not a ton, but I'll be done hopefully by the either the end of the week or the beginning of next week. I, I mean, I have to because I'm flying off to LA for the Nebula conference next week and uh, super excited about that. This is uh, a big thing because I have not put my foot into the writer's ring like this before. So I'm kind of, uh, <laughs> well, I am really kind of freaking out, but it's a uh, part of the process. Uh, I mean, I can vaguely remember pretending to be a comic artist before I was a comic book artist, you know, oh, so many, 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 many years ago. And uh, I guess I'll have to channel my inner younger person for this. But um, I'm really, really, really pumped. But I, I guess whatever, two weeks and I'm done. So there we go. Yay. Um, like I said, today's guest is Jason Copeland. His new, uh, it's not even calling it, it's a, to call it a graphic novel is almost almost a small thing. It is huge. It's a 308-page uh, graphic novel that he wrote and drew. It's his first real foray as a writer. And um, I couldn't be happier for him. This is really kind of one of those things where you manifest your dream into the thing. So check out his uh, Zoop campaign. Um, heck, Sign up for my newsletter on Substack at J. Alex Morrissey. Then you can get the info for his newsletter and then get on the Zoop campaign and then order the book. Yeah, that's that's what you should do. Great talk. I hope you enjoy it. This is me and Jason Copeland. Bloody exhausted. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm in this weird state of like, because um, the art is all done now. So like yeah. everything, like all of the digital touch-ups, all that stuff. So I'm kind of in this weird spot. And now I'm kind of like, well, I, I guess I should promote it, which is one reason why I'm doing podcasts. But also that just keeps my brain from trying to think of what else I should be doing. Because mm. um, uh, I don't know, it's out of my hands now. Like, uh, you know, the 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 Zoop campaign is going to go on may in may i've been really coy about the date because um <laughs> I'll probably get into this later but um the um the uh the my for for my newsletter i, I was like trying to entice people to sign up for my newsletter by saying uh you'll be the first people to know when the campaign goes live but when i was doing that uh i was actually going to do it on kickstarter oh okay. and and I, and this was, I hadn't even thought about like the fact that people can sign up to be notified when something launches. Cause I'm, mm -hmm. I'm from the old school when you had a Kickstarter 
there was no sign up page. You just like you just said, oh, it's live. All right, everyone go. So right. I was building my newsletter based on the, on, hey, you want to be the first to find out about this this thing? You better sign up for my newsletter. Well, now anyone that goes to the zoo page that signs there up there will be notified when it goes. So I'm like, oh, I don't know how to I don't know what to do about this. Like, I, I don't want to be the guy that, like, got people to sign up you know, under false pretenses. So mm -hmm. I'm kind of like, well, maybe if I don't tell people the actual date and, um, and I can send out a newsletter, uh, you know, the day before, or two days before saying, this is when it's going to go at this time, you know, so there are, they're pre-prepared to, and they know exactly when it's go as opposed to when it goes live and zoop emails to people saying it's live. Like, those people might be at work or they might be mm -hmm. busy or whatever. Whereas these people are. So I've been really coy about telling the date. Yeah. Which is, is the, probably the worst way to promote your, <laughs> your crowd. What, what a way, what a way to promote your campaign. I'm not yeah. going to say when it is, yeah, but uh, maybe you can sign up for the newsletter. Yeah, it's um, pretty bad. But, uh, <laughs> but I've been very coy about, I'd say the first or the second week of May is going to go. Uh, well, uh, okay. Let's let, you you talk Kickstarter and then you, you talk in Zoop. Like, what made you make the hop over to say, "Hey, I'm going to try Zoop"? Or what was the deal? Well, mostly because um, I'm not really uh, I'm not like a guy that gets into into like the business details of things. So, like finding a printer, uh, dealing with the printer. Um, you know, I don't really know paper stock all that well. I don't, I don't have that sort of background. Um, mm -hmm. And then fulfillment. So I'm Canadian. So in Canada, to ship anything out of Canada is harshly expensive, like crazy expensive. And that's even within Canada, like sending something just to like uh, to Alberta, which is like the next province over. It's it's stupid, stupid money. Like it's just hmm. so so the so the fulfillment had to be down in the states as well. And so um, when I was thinking about it and I was looking around at stuff, Zoop, uh, Zoop was there, like I've been hearing about it. And then I told my mm -hmm. wife, I'm like, oh, this is what they do. And she was like, that's who you're going with <laughs> because right. they're going to do all that uh, stuff. And you would, I would just be a, a, a horrible person to live with while I'm dealing with all that other stuff. So she's like, go with Zoop they'll take care of all of that stuff. And I was like, yeah, you know what? That's probably the best solution to this because uh, um, I'm not really a guy that really wants to get on the phone or even have email back and forth with people about these things. Right. So that it all, the Zoop guys are, are great. I've talked to them a number of times. They're, they're very capable and I'm more than happy to go with them because uh, yeah. yeah I think that's good. I mean, what's, I think the few things I think are great at that, First off, it is great for anybody outside of the U.S. to be able to have fulfillment and printing handled by, you know, a party who's dedicated to this. Mm. And the other aspect is, I don't know. I don't know if everybody's prepared for what a Kickstarter campaign requires. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't even know if... Because, because I haven't done one fully, like the to make all the little images and write up all of the different uh, tiers and uh, all that sort of stuff. Like I, I started a Kickstarter page for it uh, like years ago because I've been working mm -hmm. on this thing for years, um, and I got kind of into it. Uh, but just like figuring out what to price things at, like the Zoop guys are all just, oh yeah, here price it at this, price it at that. I'm like, okay, fine, yeah, that sounds good to mm -hmm. me. Um, they're they're the number guys they're all that like that's just not my thing i sit and i make these comic books and that's what i do and uh yeah the the whole business side of it is just uh it i wouldn't say scary it's just something that i just don't want to tackle so yeah. uh, anything, anything to cut that out of my life i I'm, i fully embrace yeah yeah I have, I have some friends who um they're starting this print endeavor and i kept and i said to them you know a lot of people go to conventions and, you know, one of the biggest, you know, sort of holdbacks for them is bringing all this material with them. And I said, you know, mm -hmm. you might be able to get clients, you know, who can pre-order ahead of time and you could just drop ship, you know, their books to the location versus 
this whole sort of like putting it on a plane or sending it, you know, FedEx or however you do it. So, yeah. um, I don't know. I mean, I, I like what I like about it is that everything, like one thing shouldn't fit everybody. Like I think, and so I think like having something like Zoop is a great solution for people like yourself. Um, probably people like me too. I mean, I, I, it, I would be much happier. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because I, I mean, like my buddies did the independent route, you know, mm -hmm. from comics. And I couldn't conceive of that. Like it just, I'm like, no, 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 no. What are you crazy? Like just really <laughs> bust your ass and go get a job with Marvel and DC. And that way, at least you don't have to worry about anything, but the doing the artwork fact. Yeah. Yeah. Writing the story. And, you know, not not 100 percent the case anymore i mean you have to be a huge promotional machine yourself just to get your comic book sort of you know mm. paid attention to but um it's um yeah i mean listen man running it's running your own business and you got to do it the way that's going to make you the most efficient and effective yeah yeah for sure um i do uh i i, I mean i've started my own publishing uh it's called 2022 um but uh i, I and i think that I, that's where i will end up going like actually becoming my own entity publisher type of situation mm -hmm. um i just with the book this big i didn't i didn't want it to be my first uh you know real undertaking i think i probably should start small which is probably what i should have done with this book in the first place but uh you know <laughs> why not start my own writing, uh, writing slash artist career with a 300 and, you know, 10 page hardcover oversized, uh, tale, like <laughs> why not? Why, why not? not? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's cause that seems like the smartest idea. Uh, you know, it's the, one of those things where you, you tell, um, you, you tell beginning writers and artists start small, do, mm -hmm. do like a, do a short story or, you know, don't your, your big giant 22 issue epic, you should put that aside and just focus on the small things. Well, mm -hmm. <laughs> here's a guy that doesn't listen to his own advice. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, so I mean, I agree. I agree <laughs> wholeheartedly with what you're saying, but my asterisk caveat, whatever you want to call it to your statement is this wasn't your first rodeo. No. Yeah. And when I, hear what you're saying and what 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 i go what i react to are the myriad creators who i'll i've can't come in you know contact with you know in the last 30 years and that inevitable early conversation of the oh i really want to do this and i've got this idea and da, 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 and you're like cool and you want to be encouraging but then you get people and they like show you something and you go through it and you look and like nothing's happened like you look through like a whole comic book issue and nothing has happened and you go, so what's, you know, what's the deal? And they go, oh yeah, well, and then they go, it's a slow burn. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, listen, there's no such thing as a slow burn if you're a new person. Like nobody's going to give you the latitude on a slow burn. Like you got to jump into where, you know, it's like James Bond, you know, let's forget the fact that we have to, you know, open up and tell a plot. Let's start off with an action scene and yeah. then we'll get into the plot. Yeah. And it's a it's a way to kind of you know sort of game the system but you know readers have a very hard time you know sort of trusting an unknown entity mm -hmm. and so while yes start small do the thing that you'll be able to complete but if you've done things and you're saying okay i am now going to slide the chips onto me yeah. rather than somebody else it is it is there are times you have to bet big yeah and i bet i bet about as big as i could i think um i would say so on myself yeah yeah uh you know the support of my wife like i've had no money come in for better part of five years i've been working on this book for about five years and i've done a few small things just to kind of have <laughs> pocket change every once in a while <laughs> sure. but uh hey. But you know, I couldn't do it without my wife. She uh she's the one that's floating this boat for sure. Yeah. So um uh so I, I, I I'm like that with uh, there's artists that are like, "Oh, I've got the story to tell. I really want to tell it." 
And I want to be the person that says, do it, you know, go do it. But that has to be under the right circumstances. Like I couldn't have mm -hmm. done this uh, without my wife. So if people don't have that sort of support structure or financial freedom, um, then that, that endeavor is much more difficult than the one that I undertook. So, mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I have to be really careful about, uh, you know, <laughs> being a big cheerleader and saying, this is what you should do because you, <laughs> sure. it's, a, it's a huge gamble. Like seriously. Well, yeah. Gamble. You gamble. And, and go ahead. Oh, I just, I was, I could have, I never put, pitched this to a publisher, not, not even once. And, um, so I was always going to do it on my own. Like it was never something that was trying i was trying to push to get me a deal at at another place like this was always going to be my thing um so there's other people that maybe that that would be the the route that they would take was that they would start this endeavor that this thing that they really want to make and then go to one of these companies and say you know i've got 50 80 page whatever mm -hmm. going throw some money at me and, and i'll bring it to you that sort of thing i just right from the get-go is like i don't want I don't want any interference. I want to just do the story that I want to do um, and give myself enough rope to either hang myself or make a new belt, you know? So uh, uh, yeah, um, yeah, it just kind of worked out for me. I mean, under the assumption that the that the, the, the Zoot campaign is going to go well. <laughs> Otherwise, sure, sure. it didn't work out for me all that great at all. But uh, well, what's uh, the, what was the, I mean, what was the impetus for that early sort of feeling of not wanting it to be engaged with anybody else like this was you know a jason production yeah um well i don't like to name names <laughs> so i won't but there is a company that i did something with that um that i think was uh not hugely successful but there was a there was a little bit of shenanigans in the in the, how the the payment advances mm -hmm. for for something else got applied to this other thing and um and which wasn't as far as i didn't take it to a lawyer i didn't pursue it but reading it it just felt like they took advantage and uh it left a really bad taste in my mouth about dealing with publishers um mm -hmm. And even though we owned all of the all the rights and everything, and and it got came back to us with no problem, uh, and my editor was fantastic. I just don't like I didn't like the the business side of it all and how um, how predatory it felt. So when I started thinking, well, I want to do my own thing. I want to write it. I want to draw it. I want it to be this, that, or whatever. I was like, you know what? I don't want I don't want to be beholden to any uh, company or, you know, just nothing. I, I want to just have free reign. So, um, right. so that was essentially, it was just that I had been felt like I had been burned whether I have or haven't it, that's <laughs> sort of inconsequential, I guess. But, um, I just felt there was like, no, I don't want to, I don't want to take this to anybody. Mm -hmm. And I also didn't want editorial saying that I couldn't do two page spreads or I couldn't do, you know, like there's no, I, I can't really break this into, individual issues because it wasn't written that way right so uh so you know i was approached by a couple publishers where they're like well um maybe um maybe uh we could instead of a hardcover maybe we could break it into individual issues and i was just mm -hmm. like well it wasn't written like that so i can't and they're like well maybe if you broke it into you know a hundred page chunks i'm like <laughs> that's not how it was written um yeah. and, it, and that was the sort of battles that i just didn't want to have to deal with and and because I'm in full control of it, even though I was starting to have these conversations, uh, it, being in in that being in that in that seat and having that kind of control was fantastic. Like I never mm -hmm. felt like I needed to to succumb to some weird thing that they wanted just so that I could get my book out there. Um, yeah, yeah, and I I don't you know I don't know I don't think it's completely like this. Okay, well we need to we need to get something from the the creator in the terms of a concession, but, you know, listen, if somebody is going to publish your thing and they, but you can, you retain all the rights, they need to figure out how to make the most money on the publishing aspect of it. So mm -hmm. when someone says, okay, let's break it up into issues or, you know, or chunks, 
the, what they're looking at is they're looking at a long-term revenue stream. Like we can mm-hmm. keep you know pulling this in over a year, two years, however long the thing would break up into, and then we can collect it you know into smaller issues, and then we can collect it again into one big chunk. Like they can really kind of make a thing out of it, and I don't begrudge them that because no. I understand I understand that, but it's the idea of having that singular piece of work that one book which makes it a thing where you go there's a beginning and a middle and an end and it mm-hmm. works and you're in the it, it would be like the movie stops you're like wait what what's what's happened they're like cool guys um come back next month and we'll play some more and you go oh no i want more you know yeah yeah well i think that that's that is inherent in in like monthly comics i don't read them anymore um sadly enough i don't really read comics anymore um partially because of that um that monthly setup like Mm -hmm. uh going to the store buying an issue getting a fraction of a story waiting a month to get another issue to get another fraction of a story i mean people people love doing that that's how like they like to read their comics and power to them um it's just not something that i enjoyed and so you know i was starting to like uh, stockpile issues so that I could like <laughs> get them all. And this was a little bit before the whole waiting for the trade situation. Um, and then, and then, yeah. And then I would just buy trades after that. But uh, you know, after five years of not making any money, I don't buy anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, there's, there's nothing to to pay those creators with in my pocket. So, um, but I've always been a somebody that would rather read the thing Mm-hmm. as opposed to individual chunks of the thing uh and and then get it repackaged and that sort of thing but yeah like you're saying you know i understand why the the companies do that i just like being able to say no yeah. <laughs> um, right and and then if you are fortunate to be with a publisher who says hey cool we we totally want to put out your 310 page singular volume oversized hardcover <laughs> but there are going to be editorial considerations that we yeah, need to, yeah. because the investment is super high per unit. So there has to be this matter of saying, we need to make sure that we are ensuring as much, you know, of a, of a return as possible on the story, because like you right now, all the chips are, you know, in front of you for your bet, they would be taking a fair amount of the chips of their own, putting it onto it. So it's, a it's, there is no sort of easy road. And because you said, Hey, I'm going to do it all myself. Well, now all of the onus is on you. And that's mm-hmm. another huge, you know, a, you know, aspect as well. So yeah, I mean, there is no free lunch, right? Yeah. But like I say, without my wife, I couldn't do it. Uh, yeah. uh, the, the nice, the nice thing about a campaign like this is that is the, essentially once it hits a goal, uh, those books will get made. Those people will get those books. And, uh, and I'm free and clear, like, mm-hmm. uh, everything's covered, whether I make any money, it, this sounds stupid and it sounds so like against what anyone should be doing, but I'm not in, I don't want to necessarily make money on this. Like mm-hmm. my, my goal was for this thing to pay for itself right? and for me to have a copy as well. <laughs> um, if it does better than that, I'm, I'll be ecstatic and sure. And, uh, and thankful for anyone that that supports me in any other in any way that they can but it's not about making a gob gobs of cash like uh i as long as it pays for itself and and i get a copy and the people that back it get a copy and they enjoy it um then i've done my job and i feel uh yeah and i'm ready to go to the next one so yeah uh, but again, uh, that's that's a privileged place for me to be sure. preaching because uh, I have the support and you know and that sort of thing. So uh, no, I mean I'm, you know I'm I'm wrapping up I'm at like the last week and a half of finishing a uh, a rewrite of my book, and you know I'm pushing out six five thousand six thousand words a day, so I'm just cruising at full speed, and it's exhausting. But like, I couldn't do it if my wife wasn't completely helping out on like all the things that I'm and being patient that, you know, waiting for me to pay attention to stuff on the weekends, do things. (laughs) And, 
you know, but like I broke my, my, I broke my ass last fall to bank a ton of cash mm -hmm. to float the ship for as long as possible. And, and once again, it's all about the chips, you know, cause I, I gotta do this cause I can't like, I can't be assured that my clients are going to like be cool and quiet for as long as I want them to be because ultimately they stop calling. So mm -hmm. you have to kind of like know when your quiet times are and jump in there and do this whole thing. So I get it, man. Like it, it's, it, it's terrifying and it's an all or nothing kind of endeavor. Like this is the story. This is the book. It's long, like yours is long. And I go, you know, like my buddy was the other day was like, Oh, well, could you break it up into three books? I'm like, they're called acts. Like acts are not a book. Like yeah. there is no, there's no conclusion. All it is is an aha moment. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I've had know. lots of people say that same exact same thing. Can you just break it into smaller chunks and release mm -hmm. them at the volume one, volume two, volume three? Well, strangely enough, the, the story actually is kind of set in three acts and, and, um, and the, and this is just kind of by accident because I am definitely not a writer. Um, in terms of uh you know figuring out all that sort of stuff it that I, I just i guess i've watched enough movies and i read enough books that it's sort of ingrained and and that's how, how things worked out but um so it could get to, it could get broken into three but that's not what i ever wanted like mm -hmm. it was never it was never about again maximizing the revenue stream like sure i could kickstart or zoop the first one and then build a, uh, you know, following and then zoop the second one. And then, the, you know, it'll be more successful. Like, and that's fine. That's what works for lots of people. And that's fantastic, but that's not how I wanted to, the book to come out. So, um, so yeah, so unfortunately uh, it's one giant book. Well, not unfortunate <laughs> for me, I think. No, it's, no, but not but enough as readers, a, but as a, but as an, as an object uh, it might be too much for, for people that are like, Oh, I'd buy it if it was, if I could buy it in smaller chunks and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, not have to <laughs> shell out one, one uh, large, I want to, don't want to say huge. It's, no, no, no. But, it's, but it's, it's yeah. going to be, it's going to be, I think uh, when you break it down, well, shit, when you look at what, uh, what people are asking on like Kickstarter for a 30 page comic book. Right. Yeah. Oh, uh, I, I know. know. I know. Uh, it's the economics of the Kickstarter issue is really an interesting thing. It's something I've I've chatted with people about over and over again. And a lot of that a lot of that price is floated by the, you know, the the backers out of love. Yeah. You know, it it is it, because if we were sheerly looking at like a spreadsheet and saying well, I'm not going to get that. I'm going to go get, you know, a Marvel comic or an image comic because it's, you know, I don't know how much they are, $3.99, $4.99, whatever they are. Yeah. And it's 20 pages and that's, and I can get it now. Like yeah. I, it, it, there's a whole, yeah, I don't know. It, yeah. Yeah. Well, and even just, just price point per page, like, um, I saw some that were for 30 pages. You were, it, they were asking 20 us dollars. Right. Right. And that's on, and then you need shipping on top of that. So for, for a comic that is slightly larger than a regular comic, you're asking me to, or you're asking others uh, cause I don't have money, but uh, <laughs> uh, you know, you're asking, you're asking for like 25, $30 right. us for a 30 page yeah. comic. And I'm just like, like, can I swear? I've, I've been, yeah, yeah, of, yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, so my book is is three hundred well three hundred eight uh, story pages, hardcover, oversized. It's going to be fifty US, mm. and it's and it's such me, a well to me it feels like whoa that's a big ask fifty dollars, uh, uh, you know, and they'll be shipping on top of that. But if you like say well if you look at it and it's like well there's like ten thirty page comics in this, and people mm -hmm. are willing to spend twenty dollars uh, for one. Well, then mm -hmm. I should be charging $200 for this book. You know what sure. I mean? Like, um, but so anyways, I think, I think uh, that uh, hopefully people will, will come out and support the book uh, at the price that what it is. And, uh, and I apologize for any shipping costs because uh, shipping is nuts. Um, yeah, it's not free. The Zoop guys are, are going to do their best to keep it all down. So if it's shipped within the U.S., I think it's pretty reasonable. 
Uh, yeah. Anytime it goes outside of the U.S., though, uh, who knows? Bets Good luck. Off. Yeah. I mean, like what? Like, you know, Reckless. Yeah, but Brubaker and Phillips, I mean, that's 25 bucks for a hardcover book. And it's probably a hundred and, you know, whatever, 20 yeah. pages, 130 pages. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think you're sort of in the same price range as that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was my goal, too, is to keep it reasonable. Um, mm-hmm. uh, that really comes down to getting the right printer that can get a decent, decent uh, product out that yep. doesn't like going to cost an arm and a leg to actually produce so um uh yeah so i don't know just fingers crossed <laughs> everything works well, out yeah no no totally uh, i mean i mean i i you know it's i mean when i noticed you on twitter i mean it was kind of through a lot of love and support from fellow creators mm-hmm. they were all very like rah 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 because i think you were sort of in that sort of third act you know, phase of finishing this thing up. And that's kind of when we are all beaten up, tired and really questioning everything. And, um, and I was, and I, and I think you were being really sort of like, Oh, like, is this, is this worth it? Kind of, kind of thought Mm -hmm. process, but everyone was like, Oh dude, we can't wait. We can't wait. And I, you know, I'm like, well, okay. Like all these cool cats are like, you know, back in this dude emotionally. So that's yeah. why I, I started paying attention and we, you know, and started engaging with you because it, it's, you know, we are the best fans for the people who are doing the best work. Like we just like fellow creators go, there's always something that we're so excited about, like our friends doing, like when we see our friends doing something, especially when it's like a thing that they're doing it gets super exciting for us because, it, you know, we all want to do that at one degree <laughs> or another. So like, yeah. it's, it's kind of a cool thing. So I feel like, was, Oh, sorry. I feel like uh, the, that uh, a lot of my uh, friends there in the comic book world, I'm li- they're living through me. <laughs> sure. Uh, right. I'm, I, I'm doing something that they, that they really want to do. And I hope that they all do it, but uh, I'm kind of like, uh, I'm kind of like the the canary in the coal mine. It's sort of like, is Jason gonna make it? <laughs> right. Is it all gonna? Is he gonna? Is it gonna all be worth it? And then I don't know. Hopefully, if if it's successful and they see that it's successful, maybe uh, that will spur them into action. You know, because I honestly think I, I, it's it's horrible to say, uh, but the comics that I that I generally get most excited about are artist writer comics, comics sure. that are more of a, a singular vision. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so I, I've got plenty of awesome, uh, comic book drawing friends that I know have a great story in them and mm-hmm. it, they're just waiting for that moment. And, um, you know, if, if I, if I, in one small fraction of a way, get them interested and in moving towards that, um, then yeah, then I, it's, it's, it's worth it. Cause I think, uh, I think the fact that I did it um that i've actually done this uh because i I've, i struggle with with imposter syndrome like you wouldn't believe and oh yeah um, and for, for me to actually get through this like you know when i started people were like yeah 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 good luck you know and <laughs> then as i pushed on like oh well you know you're you're doing it but you know you still got a long ways to go well i'm at the end and i finished it and and that to me is saying something pretty strong to myself about uh about what my belief in myself um mm-hmm. and uh and that that's not something that i would ever have articulated five years ago um, yeah so this was something that uh has really pushed me personally uh, and hopefully professionally um you know up a few notches so we'll, see. well you did you didn't know what you didn't know that's the thing like when you haven't done the thing it it it's a real big question mark and thankfully like that naive sort of i'm going to do thisness is really a, a valuable valuable tool because yeah. it's what kind of gets us to bridge the gap between i don't know if i should to i'm doing this and those kinds of like moments of you know, quiet bravado, whatever it is, is a thing that really has to happen for anybody to, because nobody's going, 
knock, knock, knock. Hello, creator person. I want you to make the thing that you want to make. Like nobody does that. So yeah. you really have to kind of like step out there and, you know, it's like walking across the, the, the gymnasium and asking, you know, that other person to dance, you know, <laughs> you know, in seventh grade and you're terrified, but then yeah. like, they're like, yes, of course, because I came to the dance, I want to dance. Yeah. And then everyone dances, you know? So I, 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 I dance. Yeah. Um, I get you. What, so what was it? What was the thing? I mean, so five years ago, you, you started putting something to paper, like how, like when, Ooh. when did the full tilt thing hit your head and how many different variations of the idea kind of rattled around until something stuck? Yeah. Um, I had been actually t thinking about full tilt for about 10 years. Okay. And, uh, but I was doing creator own or work for hire and some creator own stuff. And I never really had the time and I've never, never really thought I could, I could write it. Um, mm -hmm. And I also was questioning what I actually had to say, you know, what mm. uh, it can't just be. Um, yeah. It, uh, <laughs> it, has, it has to say something. And I don't, mm -hmm. as a, as a person, I was just like, well, I don't know. I don't know what I have to say. So, mm -hmm. um, so it kind of sat in the back of my head for a while and, and I had done a few uh, kind of sample pages and um, just kind of working through some of the visuals and that sort of thing. So it wasn't until about five years ago um, when I uh, was like, well, let's see, let's, there's a gap in my, in my schedule. Let's see what we can, what we can start doing. And I started just writing um, like a really loose outline and, mm -hmm. uh, and, basically i had scenes visuals in my head and i was like oh i want to draw that uh okay now how do i fit this into a story mm -hmm. so i had a list of scenes that i thought oh this is going to be really cool to draw um now now how do i you know patch it all together to make a story and so it, it did it went through a number of things um the the basic story was there was always going to be um you know this one the main character um, osmo miller who was gonna uh there's gonna be like a, 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 a you know an, an instigating action that was going to push him through uh all this hardship and uh and you know as he struggled to get to the the truth of whatever it was that happened at the beginning the, mm -hmm. that that basic journey was always there um but it wasn't until uh, I was probably about, uh, a hundred pages drawing in where I realized, oh, I don't, th there needs to be more than that. There need it's, it's not just like, like John wick, you know, mm -hmm. there needs to be, there needs to be a little, there needs to be a puppy scene and there needs to be a, you know what I mean? Like, right. There has to be, there has to be more than just the action. And sure. So, um, so yeah. So then that's when I actually started writing and, and that sort of thing. So I think that it did it did take on different kind of a different vibe and, a, and the story did mutate into something that's much broader and, and a much richer than what it had started as. Um, but that was one of those things where I just had to kind of work through it. And I'll, I actually did do uh, quite a bit of drawing um, before I actually sat down and wrote it. Uh, and I would never uh, tell anybody to do what I did because uh, I know that I wasted uh, probably a year's worth of, of effort um yeah. drawing stuff that just never will no one will ever see it um but it, that's part of the process uh you know i had never really written anything so i didn't know my writing process and where you know, i didn't even know how to start so that i just started where i started and i got to where i got to just through trial and error yeah well that's no that's and that's super interesting because i mean i remember my first gig my first paid gig at Marvel was a writing gig. It wasn't a drawing gig and it was a writing gig because I wanted to have a drawing gig. So I convinced an editor to hire me to write a story. So I wrote a story on spec, brought it in. They liked it. They bought it. So I got to draw the comic. And that was, that was a sort of the, 
now I didn't have any sort of nothing that said I was a writer zero like but yeah. I knew enough to, uh, how to make a story interesting for a, a short period of time mm -hmm. so that's like I had a premise I put characters in there I didn't have to come up with characters because they existed at Marvel so I was just putting something together and you know you you use the the term inciting I incident which seems to me that you're like hey like were you doing a lot of sort of on the run research as you're kind of like, okay, so we, what do I need to do to like, how do I do this? And what's the structure of this? And like you go on and you click, you're Googling stuff to find out stuff and you're buying, and it looks like you're buying books. Um, yeah. I've got a, I've got a save the cat and I've yes. got a, well, what else do I got? I've got into the woods. Okay. Good one. Yeah. And I, uh, oh, I've got one more in there somewhere. I can't, this in a really bad order, but, uh, yeah, I, I definitely did. Oh, I think I've got like, um, Oh shit! I've got the creating creating a graphic novel with the I think that was um, Steve was it Lee? Oh, I can't remember who it was the guy that did uh, Polar no not Polar um, Whiteout uh, oh blanking, yeah blanking on his what? name now me too yeah, yeah. I know I got these books and I'm just like you know what um, let let's figure out the structure let's figure out this thing. And uh, I actually wanted, I actually forgot about this before I even started doing outlines. I did these little cards um, and mm -hmm. I still write on them to this day. They're sitting by my computer where I wrote stuff. Uh, assassin, assassin enters house, mm -hmm. uh, you know, car explodes. And I just, I wrote all these things and then I, I kind of mixed them around and tried to figure out, you know, a story out mm -hmm. of all that. Like where they, like, where they fit. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I, most of them I didn't use, but it helped me because I'm a visual learner. I need to see things. So having mm -hmm. little cards and moving them around and stuff was like, oh, OK, yeah, I can do this. And so as I got more into that, I would write scenes down and I would put them down and on cards and I would move the cards around and see how if, if I do this scene, then I could do this scene. But what happens mm -hmm. if I put this other scene in front of this other scene? So before I actually really wrote anything. I was using these cards to sort of uh, see it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then, uh, and then from that, I, I, I wrote a lot of it. A lot of the, of the, of my script actually is dialogue. I wrote it in dialogue. So a lot of people do that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know what, it really helped me because, um, you know, I designed the characters, but, and you, you get a feel for the characters, but until you actually hear them talk, and, and figure out how they relate to other characters and how they talk to the other characters. Like, like this one doesn't like this one. So he's, you know, he talks and he talks like this and he says these sort of things. And, and, you know, how do they, how does their tone change depending on who they're talking to and that sort of thing. Um, that all came about from just saying, uh, I'm going to write, I'm going to write this scene all on dialogue. I'm just going to see what they right. say to each other. And um, yeah, and I, the, the majority, the first, the first, the first real draft of that of full tilt was all dialogue. Okay. Yeah. Well, first, uh, Greg Rucka, that's who that's who wrote the uh, the book. Greg Rucka. Oh, right, right. And um, I think what's really interesting when you say that is that because listen, you know, com writing comic books and drawing them with dialogue, well, you're you're half cheating because the characters are right there on the page emoting. So you can just write words and people are going to get a lot of inference by looking at the faces or the body language. And I'm joking when I say cheating. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, but the idea of approaching it from a dialogue point of view really does imbue a lot of character and personality before the artwork is, is approached. And I think that's a really interesting way of, coming toward that so that's kind yeah. of cool dude yeah and i think that because dialogue is always shifting too um mm -hmm. i don't even know like what percentage of that or original dialogue was is even still in the book i would like to think that you know maybe 50 percent of it or whatever but um but it was it was sort of that uh it, it was just a really natural way for me to kind of get to know the characters and and figure out exactly what they wanted and how they dealt with each other and that sort of thing, um, which, um, yeah, 
Uh, it needed to happen. I couldn't have just sat down and wrote a story about with these characters. They needed to talk to each other first, I think. Right. Well, there's, I mean, from what I've picked up so far, you know, in what you've shared with me, there is a, um, you know, there's a hard boiled detective quality to, to the, to the world that you're, you're bringing the reader through, which is a very dialogue driven genre. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of like, you know, direct language that happens in, in, in that, in that genre. So it, it is, it is kind of understandable. But surprisingly enough, there's not a lot of, there's, there's, there's no like, uh, uh, um, there's no uh, thought balloons. There's no captions of like inner dialogue, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's plenty of, uh, there's plenty of stuff where nothing gets said. Um, right. Uh, I, I, I really wanted to make sure that uh, that I told the, the story with with the art mm -hmm. um, as much as any of the words are in there. So uh, that's one reason for all the two page spreads, I guess. Um, <laughs> but I will say that my two page spread. So it's no, normally when you say two page spreads, you think like Kirby and stuff where they it's like one giant image. Right. Um, yeah. Whereas mine are more. Uh, there's insets. So there's, sometimes it's even just, you know, a bunch of uh, boxes, but uh, or panels, but um, but there's some sort of central image that combines the two sides together, that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. it's, it's not just like eye candy and there's like no storytelling. It's, you know, there, there's there's lots of stuff there. <laughs> yeah, no, there there is. And, and just to reiterate for anybody who's not following you on Twitter, um, how many uh, spreads did you end up with? Well, you know what? I haven't counted them yet. So my last newsletter, I ran, I ran a, a contest um, to for people to guess how many two page spreads are are in this book, and I actually don't know. I haven't I haven't counted. Them. <laughs> I'm going to uh, I'm going to write my my next newsletter. It's going to go out before the the campaign goes live, and I'll uh, I'll let people know who won. And so this will be the ultimate revelation newsletter. It's going to tell how many spreads and the date of the uh, of the oh, campaign. I it's mean, a, it, it's the it's the uh what is it the uh it's the, the rosetta stone <laughs> it's the it's the rosetta stone of of newsletters yeah yeah um yeah de yeah definitely <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah i don't know how many uh two page spreads are in there uh honestly i, I kind of want to play the game along with everyone else because uh, well then i'm gonna i'm gonna go even though i know that's wrong because i've seen more than it but i'm gonna go the price is right route and i'm gonna say one <laughs> definitely not <laughs> uh, i have a I've if everyone to... over but jason if everybody over guesses uh, i win yeah. yeah i know there are a couple that are are under that are much higher than what you've guessed <laughs> <laughs> um, Damn. yeah yeah i've got a I even it's hard to explain because it's again it's not technically one giant spread mm -hmm. but i've got 11 22 page spreads that connect so as as one two page spread is ending, the mm -hmm. next one continues on, even just for like an inch or whatever, and then there's more panels or whatever. But yeah. I have eleven twenty two page spreads that make that are essentially continuous. So yeah, um, so there's at least eleven. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I wish I had had that information before I uh, opened my mouth. Yeah. Well, you know, I think, uh, I think I shared one, the three with you. <laughs> yeah, no, you did. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 most, mostly it seemed like it was all spreads. Yeah. It was. A, yeah. yeah. I go a little crazy. Uh, there, there's a chunk there where there's maybe like 11 regular pages and then I'll put mm -hmm. in a two page spread and then, you know, eight regular pages and a two page spread. And then uh, <laughs> I hit a, hit a point uh, around that 22 or the 11, 11 consecutive ones where I was just like, you know what, <laughs> I'm just going to do them. <laughs> so I just, I, I have them all over the place. Um, nothing as big as that one. I've got a couple, uh, I think a four pager. So like two, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, yeah, yeah. I've got, a, I think I have a couple of those as well. And then a bunch of just yeah. regular two pagers, you know, regular ones. And... Well, it's, it, I mean, it, <laughs> It's an interesting way of thinking because it has to change your thinking. I was thinking it, it reminds me of, you know, what Jim Williams 
is doing with Echo Lands. Like mm-hmm. he's doing a horizontal book mm-hmm. and he is really recontextualizing how visual storytelling is is done yeah in the structure i've got the first one right here actually yeah yeah it's it's a fantastic book it's brilliant and and it's just like yeah it's it's Mm mind-blowing every page is just like wow i know i know all the different style changes it's crazy mechs and stuff like oh it's like yeah it's fantastic um yeah well, I'm just drawn to that. I think so. Kill All Monsters is a book I do with Mike May, and we're going to do some more, mm-hmm. but that's a landscape book as well. And I think that my brain seems to work better in landscape, like that format right. of landscape as opposed to portraits. So uh, the two page spreads just feel right in terms of layout. Yeah. Uh, I seem to like a longer, uh, you know, canvas as opposed to a taller canvas. So, yeah, I don't know. Just whenever I felt like I, was it getting stuck or was it was, you know, just not getting interesting for me to draw? Then I turned it into a two page spread. So, well, how how important is cinema to you? Is it a very big chunk of your your creative self? Uh, like watching films and stuff? Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm a huge. Well, I used to be a huge film buff. Uh, sure. I used to watch pretty much everything I could get my hands on pre or post 1969 i can't really get into old films uh i i feel really i feel like i'm somehow missing out but when i try to watch classics that are semi-old i get really (laughs) bored um visually they are interesting but the story and the acting i just can't get into it so um so pretty much anything after like 1969 uh i'm pretty into um and you're in after after 69 okay yeah you know once kind of money you know, <laughs> but once modern felt like modern storytelling kind of came in editing got faster uh, mm-hmm. uh they didn't treat their audience like idiots uh you know the you had to make more of a the the, the connections between plot points and stuff was a little more uh ambiguous and so left you kind of questioning what mm-hmm. the story was or what their motivations were it, what everything wasn't just black and white in terms of you know oh i get it this is it's good versus evil um sure that sort of thing the, there became more gray involved um and that seems to come in you know once uh once the hippies started getting their hands on cameras and stuff so uh <laughs> um yeah so that's kind of where i where i live uh i love I, I love the, the kind of early and mid seventies. Mm-hmm. That, that's sort of where my, that's sort of where my aesthetic kind of lives. Um, uh, but I, I, yeah. I like new films too, but. Yeah. 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 No, I'm, I'm just curious. I mean, because you're, you're sort of emphasizing the horizontal, mm. you know, layout and there's a lot of, there's a lot of sensibility to, you know, the film, the film frame if you start looking in that direction. So I'm just curious how, if it, uh, yeah, no, I, I do. I, I, I do love watching films. Yeah. 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 I, uh, introduced my wife, I guess late last year to the conversation, maybe early this year. Oh, that's a fantastic film. That's such a good movie. And like, she was just just so good. She was so blown away by it because she had never seen it before. So Mm -hmm. this is like complete, you know, not, not no, like, I mean, when I introduced her to, um, you know, three, three days of the condor mm-hmm. decades ago, you know, she was just blown away by this. I'm like, Oh man, like th- there's this whole sort of seat of that early 70s cinema where she could, you know, probably I could just keep pulsing these films into her and have her mind get reblown every time. Yeah. That's when the, it seemed like people were questioning, uh, the structure you know like mm-hmm. people were starting to get a little more savvy to the that there was puppet masters pulling strings and and uh and the more cynical i guess i'm, a, I'm more of a cynical type for uh, you know everything was all you know isn't everything great and then the you know the late 60s early 70s where it was like no nah, things aren't that cool now well i think that's i mean it's it's obviously you said it before with the hippies but i mean it, it is the you know the sort of the counterculture response to the status status quo because of you know pro, protracted you know military you know campaign which really just sort of unsettled everybody and i think 
you know, we've, we've sort of lived through that again here, you know, with the last 20 years where I, I feel that we may have cinema might be in that sort of vein as well. There's a lot of really good pieces of cinema that are coming out, but there's just more movies being produced that you have to kind of sift through. So yeah. like there was the, how was Adam, the Adam driver one that came out last fall. Not the marriage one. No, 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 no. Same director. Same, same. It's about the family. Oh, it takes place in the eighties. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm blanking on the name. It's a, such a good movie. Yeah. I'm blanking on it too. Uh, where there's like the, the fallout thing there. The yeah. 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 Explosion. Yeah. The whole, the whole, yeah. The whole, the whole sort of like, you know, this whole send up on, on the, the disaster film genre. Yeah. And, but like, it was this whole sort of really interesting, you know, play on does, you know, does, does consumerism drive existential, you know, angst or does existential angst drive consumerism? Like it was this really great question that was being spun around throughout the whole, the whole film. And it was, yeah, I mean, it was, is Noah Baumbach, just an absolutely brilliant film. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. It was one of those ones where I had no idea where it was going. Mm-hmm. like it was just you just you you were you strapped in and you went <laughs> yeah. he, he took you on a ride and even yeah. like that, that closing scene where they're all uh dancing by the yeah the, check sure. it's the, like, credit, it's like, the credit scene yeah what what is that uh, it was fantastic mm-hmm. yeah there was nothing about that film that i, I didn't like i was just yeah. like this is a fantastic movie yeah <laughs> no the, it was it, it, it was it was brilliant on every aspect and i i i, I just I saw we the, can't figure out the name of it <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, we are two real cinema buffs, apparently. Yeah, exactly. I, 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 just, I just saw this, the card for it yesterday and I'm like, oh my God, I want to watch that again. It was that, it was that uh, exciting, but yeah. I'm, uh, I'm uh, you know what? I'm not even going to look it up. Um, <laughs> if, you, if you're listening and you're going yelling, if you're not yelling at us right now, go Sorry. look it up yourself <laughs> and, uh, and, and watch it. Everybody apparently has Netflix at this point. So just, watching yeah <laughs> oh my gosh yeah that's so um bad. so did you did you end up with the script or did you sort of chunkify it like a here and there and here and there well i chunkified it up until about um, i was about two years in and i i was working from chunks and then i realized that that's when it kind of i realized oh i might be um i might be totally wasted my time because i had no sense of it as a whole everything there I, I i know that there were scenes and there were uh and you know there's pages and stuff that i really liked and I, and I was like i how does this all hang together so i actually right. stopped drawing at about the two year mark and um and just decided i need to write this so i sat down and i gathered all of the bits that i had on my google docs you know mm-hmm. one page scenes i had probably had like 25 different google docs going and uh, so i had to like figure out all the stuff that i wanted to keep and what i had actually drawn already and and stuff that i had drawn already that didn't work anymore that i had to get rid of and all that stuff yep. and i took a year and i didn't draw a lick and I took a year and I, and I made a script, I wrote a script and, um, and then I sent it off. I got an editor in, uh, James Powell, who I worked with in Kill All Monsters. Um, and I said, you know, is this any good? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, I, I had a feeling like, yeah, I'm onto something here. And, uh, mm-hmm. so he read it and, uh, his reaction was like, Hey, this is actually good. <laughs> it was like, Oh, excellent because <laughs> nice. uh, i was not anticipating that. i was anticipating uh a, a script with lots of red x's you know sure and um and uh, i got the sense like yeah um i've got i've got a story here and and cool. it seems to be in a in a pretty good form and so he gave me a few notes and um and i tightened certain things up and i added a scene that maybe smoothed over or you know harkened back f- to another scene just to kind of give it some sort of continuity that sort of thing um yeah and then after i was pretty much set that script in stone i started drawing again so it was sort of two years on when you're writing and then two more years One, two years back yeah. yeah and um 
Yeah, and you know, if I hadn't done that, who knows? It'd be a hot mess, I think. Uh, sure. Well, it's, yeah. So, you know, when I gave myself the permission to write prose, it was a very different approach to storytelling than a comic book. And I had a very hard time with the fact that they couldn't see the whole thing at once. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, when you're doing a drawing, you can tell, oh, that hand needs work or this needs work. Like it's, the feedback is relatively immediate. Uh, you know, maybe you can go away from it, get a cup of tea, come back and look at it and go, oh, wait a minute. Like, you know, um, but it was a real tough thing to kind of look at this, this, this sort of long thing and have to really kind of trust it. Um, and when I wasn't writing the the first book as an outlined form, it was even harder because I was really just gut going by the gut. Okay. This feels right. This half feels right. And so much of it gets removed in the long run, but you just kind of do a thing. And it's that time where you look at it and say, I need to look at this whole thing. And that's when you sit down and you wrote, you wrote a script because you were piecemealing it and you were kind of mm -hmm. finding your way through the darkness toward, towards these sort of pockets of light. But then you're like, Oh, okay, I need to look at this whole thing. And that's a really important moment because it allowed you to look at a, at a work and go, okay, where is this going? What is, what is this arc doing? Why is this character? Hey, we've got a bad guy. Why do we have a bad guy? What is this bad guy's connection to everything? Like, why are, why is that person angry? Why does this person want that? And you have to make all these sort of connections because that's the only reason the reader is going to be paying attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. It, yeah. I, I, I am like one, I, I can't believe that I even, uh went that long without sitting down and 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 figuring out what the story was but you know again you know, it 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 brings me back to the fact that i had never really written anything and i right. had no sense of my process um and uh you know i got to where i got to uh dumb luck um you know through you know from feeling my way through the darkness um mm -hmm. But it had to it had to get done. Now that said, that when I do my next one, uh, I'm going to write it as a script. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, totally. But, like, uh, and it seems like a no brainer, right? Like, why would yeah, you write it as a script? Well, but I had no so idea. Artists. So this is what I've I've observed, and I and I and I was, you know, I, I'm not saying guilty of it, but I did it all the time. Is that artists who who write tend to write with a pencil in hand, mm -hmm. and they they thumbnail out story. They go, okay, well, this can happen, that can happen, because you know they have the little notes of saying car crash. They have the little notes of saying this thing. And then you you kind of piece it all together with a pencil with you know small little sketches, which is totally understandable. Mm -hmm. But the thing I always say, like to say to people, like, it is so much easier to change a sentence than it is to change a page. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 There's there's uh I got rid of most of them. I had pages that uh I had done full scenes and um I, I mean I actually kind of Frankenstein some of them. I I would scan it and and steal a uh you know a panel or a hand or a face or whatever. You know, scan it and then stick it on my roughs so that when I printed it out again, you know, the face is pretty much already there. I would redraw mm -hmm. it, but um so you know, I I did steal uh, a bunch of stuff that I had already finished on other pages that didn't make it. Um, but there was, a, there was a number of things that I had to throw away and no one will ever see, like they've just, they're gone. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm pretty brutal with my work. Uh, I don't really keep it around as much as I probably should. Uh, uh, if it wasn't working, it probably just went right into the bin. So, um, yeah. Yeah. You should be like, uh, was it Ben Caldwell, man? That guy, that guy sells all his underdrawing sketches. I don't, I don't know how, like, honestly, I don't think I could draw the amount of things that he draws. He's insane. And still have a life. Like, and he has kids and he goes and he does all this, like. Um, He's a human being. Yeah, he, he, he does stuff. And I, like all these pieces and they're shaded. And yeah, they're, yeah. And they're like they're so uh fantastical sometimes and mm -hmm. like oh you just came up with like this like just on the spur of the moment yeah and 
I just his output. I just like holy crap! Like man, he's yeah, he's he is he is a special special thing out there. <laughs> it's, it, it's amazing. Well, you know, there are uh, people out there that there are just special. Like oh you know, yeah, we we talk about you know well I talk about the fact that anyone can draw. A lot of it is just muscle memory. You got to just practice, practice, practice. Uh, there is a certain level of sight that people have uh, that other people just don't have. So yeah. yeah, like Ben's one of those guys, you know, Bill Sienkiewicz is one of those guys. They just see things different and they're able to record those things that they see. Um, and that's just something that you, you just never really going to get. Uh, yeah. Well, there's a difference between draftsmanship and artistic, you know, expression. And, you know, I think if the person is 100% dedicated six months you can teach someone to be competent in yeah. six months yeah. like real real full-time at it but but there, there's another level of spark that certain people have and Ex whatever that's exactly yeah ben's one of those yeah. guys <laughs> yeah totally curse so exactly curse uh, yeah no, that's I, I, I wouldn't um know. what so in the literary world when you sort of you pitch your, your story to, to, you know, publishers and agents, there's a thing called the comp title. And I don't know if you know what the comp title is, but the comp title is it's, you know, John Wick meets oh. blankety blank right. and blankety blank. Yeah. So like I've, cause I, you know, looking what you, you have, you sent me, there's all these like great, like references to other stuff that I'm like, visually, I'm like, Oh my God, this is, this feels like this and this smash together. And I love it. You know? So if you are saying, Hey, this is like, what's your comp title? It can be two, two different things. It can be three things, whatever you feel. And uh, it can be books. It can be comics. It can be movies. It could be music. I don't care. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I would say that it is, <laughs> uh yeah to put it all in one sentence it's uh it's it, it, it <laughs> it's the warriors uh okay cool the warriors if uh meets uh the godfather set in blade runner <laughs> nice um, I love it. Yeah, uh, James uh, James Powell wrote uh, one of his posts. He 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 summed up he summed up full tilt, and uh, I can't remember. I wish I can remember how he said it. But it was like uh, it was like Ronan. It's it's like Frank Miller's Ronan. If it had been conceived by the Godfather, and uh, and the doula was. Uh, Oh, I can't remember what it was. And it was just like, I was like, that's exactly it. Like, holy shit. <laughs> um, <laughs> I wish I could find it, but it would take me like half an hour to find it online. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, and it's, it's Sin City. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there's definitely Frank Miller. Frank Miller's all over that thing. Um, yeah. R Ronan is the book that got me into comics that, that, I, I liked Dude, comics. Nice. Yeah, I liked comics. I I bought comics. I'd go to the com. I go. Wow, well, this is before comic book stores. That's how old I am. But um, uh, you go to the corner store and you'd pick up, you know, your copy of Thor or you'd and you know, and there was no real sense. I was just like, oh, I like these. Um, mm -hmm. it was when I went to a comic book store and I found Ronan and it was just like, this is what it's all about. This is what mm -hmm. actually what comics are really for me. And, um, you know, and then you, f you find other things through that, but that was the, that was the moment. And it's always Ronan is, is always been the book. Um, I, it sits by my drawing table. Um, <laughs> I've got, uh, I've got the, uh, absolute version. I've got the regular trade. I've got all the individuals. I've got the artist edition. Um, yeah, I have it. I had it on uh, my, eye on, um, comiXology till they, shut the bed and uh yeah i can't get into it anymore i don't i don't do amazon anymore but uh yeah so i've got like i don't know six or seven different sets of this book like this book is mm -hmm. is my in my dna so um yeah this book uh 
leans leans fairly heavily on my love for Miller work. And it seems like that's the, a bad thing to say these days. Um, you know, Holy Terror was know. definitely a piece of shit. Um, well, but, uh, but there was, there was some nice drawing in it as well. Um, sure. Uh, but you know, uh, the early Miller stuff, I, I think is fantastic still. Well, I was, yeah, I mean, I was a huge daredevil reader when it was, when it, his run was going, but, and, you know, and reading other books, but man, you, for me, when Ronin came out, that was like, I feel that was the change mm -hmm. within going, oh, there's something more than just the regular superhero comic book thing. Now, I knew that the other stuff existed and I probably had bought a bunch of stuff, but it wasn't until I really grabbed the book and went through it. I'm like, this is the best thing I've, you know, at the time it was the best thing I'd ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, it challenged, it challenged young Jason, uh, mm. the story, um, layouts, pacing, all that stuff is just, um, it wasn't what I was reading. Like it was nothing like what yeah. you, you, I would pick up at the corner store and, um, yeah, it was just, all right, let's, let's go. And I actually, that's when I started drawing comics, I, you know, as a, but however old I was, 12 or 13 or whatever. Um, but I actually started, you know, oh, I'll write, I'll, I'll write my story. And, and, you know, the last like three pages and it didn't mean sure. anything. But um, that, it, that was the beginning of my whole sense of just, oh, this is what comics about. This is what I want to do. So, um, yeah. yeah. Well, it's, a, it's the difference. You know what it is? It, was, it, it reminds me of something you said earlier is, it's sort of like writing comics, that visual way of writing a comic book is like playing with an action figure. Mm. You know, you had, you had all the little notes, but like, instead of notes, you have spaces in your room and you got this action figure and you're like, all right, well, he's going to stand here, but then he's going to jump off of this and go over to that thing. And, you know, and then other things become, you know, other sort of obstacles, like, you know, whether it's a vehicle or a, a old stuffed animal becomes a monster that has to fight. But the point being is that you kind of string together this sort of kinetic storyline mm -hmm. when you're, when you're, when you're a kid with these, these characters and looking at comic books and the idea of making those, even though as much as you may love all the characters that you loved in the in the books, it, it it was that. It was just taking the action figure and moving it around. But then you read Ronin and you're like, oh, this isn't Thor. This isn't the X-Men. This isn't Batman. This is a completely different thing. Yeah. I don't have to take the existing action figure and do that th and make them have that adventure. I can do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. And then you get to really kind of, kind of come up with your own thing. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It was the moment where I realized that, um, like, yeah, that, that, the, that it was, it was wide open that you could do, you could essentially do what you wanted to. Um, I mean, and for the, for the industry, that was essentially the moment I think when, uh, when it opened up too, right. It's like he, he would, he had his thing going on in Marvel, mm -hmm. but then he was like, Oh, I really want to do my own thing. And DC was like, Oh, here, here's, here's a blank check. Draw what you sure. want. And uh, how do we, how what, do we get the hottest guy on our, on our side? Yeah. Oh, we'll just let him do whatever he wants. Exactly. And that, yeah. and uh, again, that's when, that's when I think real magic is made is when mm -hmm. that singular vision is given the chance to do whatever they want. Um, yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, of course it doesn't always work out. It's, it could, could be a big fail, but you, you know, you got to take that leap. So um, yeah, that was it. That book was, was the beginning of it for sure. Hmm. Yeah. What were, so like, what are the inspirations that, you know, not, now this is it doesn't have to be the comp title because the comp title is sort of like a forensic study of the of the you know of the crime scene. And you go well clearly you know <laughs> the Godfather came in here and he you know, and you know and, and turned on you know Blade Runner and then shot the guy like like that's that's the that but like for you like what was inspiring you internally to see to see a story come together 
you know, like were there, mm. were there sequences and events in your life or in the world or in fiction that you went, oh, this is what's missing. And then you put it together. Oh man, I, I, I wish, <laughs> I wish there was, uh, I don't know. I think it was more an internal need to see if I could do it. Mm -hmm. um, it was more questions being asked about myself and, and my abilities. Um, it's kind of like seeing uh, Everest and saying, can I climb it? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I, I don't know if there was anything exterior that drove me to make it. I think it all kind of came from within. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, I think that's probably probably how it started even yeah uh i think yeah i think that that's probably it i it's just one of those things where you know we worked in the industry for long enough that and you saw scripts and you saw stories and you thought well i could write that <laughs> and then then there's just that moment in your brain you go like hey i could write that and um why don't i and i think that I'd been feeling that for a while and I think it was more just an interior question that I needed to answer. And uh, mm -hmm. that's sort of what drove me. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it's a good place to come to when it is an internal um, matter. I know, I, I know that I yeah, definitely had that internal drive. Um, I have a supported heavily by my wife saying, I really think you should write something, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't going to happen until I said, I need to do this. Um, and then as far as the story inspirations go, there were external things. There were elements that I said like, Hey, wait a minute. Like, why is nobody talking about this or why, you know, and it was one of those kinds of things where then you just make that note and you put it away and you put it away. And then eventually you're like, I got to write something. And then you start looking at all the notes going, okay, what, what do I got in here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh yeah, this story started just as a, almost as an exercise to just make sure that I could write something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, well, it's terrifying. Yeah. Oh, 100%. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, I've, I've spent a, a large portion of my life knowing that I can draw at a certain level and that's mm -hmm. never really been, um, you know, up for debate really. Uh, but writing, uh, you know, I've never, mm -hmm. never taken that test. So this was, uh, this was me jumping in the deep end <laughs> without yeah, really no deep. water wings. Like, I'm just like, Oh, geez, here we go. Um, and again, I probably should have started with, uh, a, a, a short story, <laughs> but that, that's not who, that's not who I am apparently. <laughs> uh, well, you know, the thing is, is that, <sighs> you know, you're not 25, you're not 30 years old. Mm -hmm. And there's a matter of the ability to draw from decades of experience and convert whatever skill sets you have that are a visual skill set into this literal skill set. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's, it, it's, it's not so much as you're like a, you know, you're a young person saying, Hey, I want to make a comic book. <clears throat> I guess I'll just make a giant comic book you know, with, <laughs> with nothing to fall back on. And not to say that that can't be done. <clears throat> the problem is, is that there's a lot of walking in the, you know, in the wastelands mm -hmm. that happened that you just go, and, you know, you had enough pre you were prescient enough to stop and say, wait a minute, I need to, I need to look at this and figure out if the script, if there's a script work that can work in this rather than just to kind of slog on and then go, I have no idea what I have here. You know, some sort of uneditable piece of film. It, it could easily have been that. Yeah. Sure. If I didn't, if I sure. didn't stop. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, so, I mean, I think there's a, there's a lot, there's a lot to be said that. So I, while I think our internal narrative to be uh self-deprecating and you know and you know sort of like hey i i don't know i was crazy whatever you know yeah sure okay but because you had no question that you could visually tell a story at least you were halfway there in the terms of like i can tell a story and i have ideas let me see if i can put that you know on paper yeah yeah 
I was actually uh, just saying online that I think um, so. I I, uh, I got a Star Wars uh, role playing game. I I started writing a, doing a campaign with a bunch of players, and it, that that was right at the time that I was started to work on Full Tilt and uh-huh. and and having having role playing games and writing writing scenes and writing uh, you know uh, non player character motivations and and dialogue and, mm-hmm. and, and forming that stuff that helped me hugely when huge it came, when it came to writing the story it was like oh this is sort of like what i was doing with with star wars with the campaign oh i could do mm-hmm. this like and and that's when i started realizing oh i could i could put these scenes together because i was making you know each each adventure or whatever um or each session would lead into another session and i would have that continuity i would have you know these characters mm-hmm. that would reoccur and there would be themes and there would, and I was like, Oh my God, I could do this. I totally yeah. could do this. And then that's essentially what I did. It was like, all right, I'm going to start writing my comic, but I don't know if I would have done it if I wasn't playing the role-playing games. Like that was, uh, that, yeah, that, that was, that's my, of, yeah. The moment that I realized, Oh, I could probably do this. And that's, that's one of the two, what I would call my two superpowers when it comes to writing is if I get caught on something, I'm like, I'm really having a hard time figuring out what the description is for this. I'll sit down and draw the thing mm-hmm. and I go, okay, that's what this thing is. Now I just write what I see on this piece of paper. And the other thing is that I'm, you know, God, I mean, I started role-playing D and D in the, like the late seventies and I was an inveterate LARPer through the nineties and into, oh, yeah. I guess into the two thousands. And it was all of this character play and you got to generate dialogue. Like nobody's telling you what to say. Like it is all improv improvisational acting. And so when I sit down and I'm writing a story, I'm just playing these characters and Mm -hmm. do the thing and just kind of writing it out. So like go role play. Like if you want to write role play, yeah, you don't have to run a game, just role play, get your feet, figure out what it is like, what it's like to talk and talk like somebody else. That's not you. Yeah, try to get into a different uh, frame of mind to think, think, try to think differently than you would think and see and see light, you know, try to see the world through a different set of eyes and a different perspective. Because if you can kind of wrap your head around that, then you can write characters, you know, aren't you? Oh, dude, all my characters, all my characters were a variation of me when it came to like, like to LARPing for years. But when you would get to NPC. Yeah. You know, when you were, you know, you were helping out for the weekend, well, you got to play like 25 different characters of the weekend. So you were like, oh, you're a shifty, you know, flagon salesman. Okay, I'll go do that. You know, like it, yeah. it didn't matter. And, it, you know, like why, why go out and play a goblin if you're not going to make it fun? Yeah, like, it was just, exactly. <laughs> it was all this kind of silliness, but you put it together. And like, there's a great saying, like somebody said, like, make the most use use you can out of your throwaway time. Mm -hmm. So while putting on dumb elf ears and getting in a costume and running around in the woods might not have been like, you know, the path to fame and glory. um, It built a skill set that I would not have had otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, and I think that's like, you know, reading comic books and watching movies like all this kind of stuff teaches you, you know, voice, dialogue, storytelling, et cetera. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I, so it's super, it's super important. Like when you say this stuff, I'm like, oh yeah, that's what it is. Like, that's all the stuff. Do that. Yeah. Yeah. And be gutsy. <laughs> yeah. And have a, have, yeah. a, have a supportive wife <laughs> or, or spouse. Or oh, partner. yes. <laughs> a support, yeah. A support. Listen, nothing beats a supportive support system. That is like yeah. the, the biggest thing. And yeah, and that's actually, you noticed, you, you mentioned um, about uh, how you kind of came to know me online through people that were vocal about, about the book. And that's something mm-hmm. that I really appreciate um, that people online have gotten behind me for years, like on literally the years uh supporting giving me uh you know uh well wishes and and just that positive energy to keep going because uh five years in this tiny little space in my house uh, alone um 
I don't know. I wouldn't have got through it without without people, you know, vocalizing their interest in in the book, mm -hmm. and for the extended amount of time that I've been doing it. So um, I, my, I'm always very appreciative of anyone that uh, that is supporting me and and giving me any sort of kudos or just anything online. Like that's it sounds sad that that we kind of live by these uh, moments of people saying nice things about us uh, online, but without it i don't know if i would have actually finished the book well dude i it so there's this thing about and i was just listening to the about your your personal brand mm. i was listening about that this morning and the idea is you are you get what you put out there mm -hmm. and you know all those people supporting you they're supporting the thing that they see in you that they want to see more of. So it is, you know, so they're, they're, they're only reflecting the, the sort of the goodness and the support that you put out there. Mm -hmm. Like it's really, it's really all that. Like, I mean, you, cause if you had been anything else, but what you are, I might've just moved on. And I'm not <laughs> saying that I, and I'm no big deal in any sense. I'm just saying, but I'm a human. Yeah. And like you, you go, wait a minute. Like, this is not a person that I don't want, that I, I want to, I want to walk past. Like, I just want to make sure that I'm paying attention. And yeah. I think that's what it is. So, yeah, I mean, no, you don't get to see these people on a regular basis because they're all little, you know, blocks of pixels on your screen, but <laughs> they, it doesn't mean that they're not people who are somewhat involved, engaged in, you know, in your creative life. Yeah. Right. And, and I appreciate every single one of them. Um, yeah. Yeah. I do try to be rather supportive of the industry um, in, in whatever way I can. Uh, unfortunately, financial isn't really in the, in the cards these days, but um, you know, I, I attempt to, I say, I say positive things to people all the time. And, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm a, I'm a true believer in that. You don't talk about the stuff that you hate, talk about the stuff that you love and totally uh, and build people up. Don't tear people down. So um, yeah. Yeah, so that's sort of where I live in terms of online, well, in life in general. I, there's no point in, in, yeah. So I think that you are, are, you know, I think you've you've kind of put your finger on part of why people support me is that I think that I support people. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not a, I'm not a, <laughs> I'm not a person that tears down. Uh, I'm a person that tries to build up. So, um, yeah, and I appreciate anyone that ever tries to build me up. That's for sure. Yeah, it's I mean, I mean, listen, I think all all the creator, anybody who's a creator of anything knows how hard it is to take an idea and bring it to the world. Mm -hmm. And far be it from a creator to, you know, disparage another creator's effort in trying to do that. Like it, it's we all know we all know the, the fight. So, it, it, you know, we're all the best cheerleaders for that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let me just dive into one little thing here. Hopefully it'll be quick and then we can get, we can sort of tie everything off. But um, <laughs> well, this has been fun I, so far. So. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to, now this is, this is the, you know, if this is like one of those, you know, sound effects kind of podcasts, it's like the, the beef music would come on. Um, <laughs> yo, what's up, man? You're busting into my racket of, uh, of, uh, of interviews. Yo, what's up with that? You starting a podcast. No, it's, oh, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. it's not a real tough in street. I don't know. Um, no, no, that's awesome, dude. So you're going to start, you're starting a podcast soon. Well, that's the plan. Um, I, um, <laughs> I, I, I sometimes talk the talk. Sometimes I don't walk the walk. Uh -huh. I think, uh, I think that it's something that, um, that I could do. Mm -hmm. Um, and I definitely have interest in it. Uh, so that the people that, uh, don't know me or or haven't been following me or whatever the podcast idea of mine is called draw like you and uh and what i would be doing is interviewing comic book artists who uh who of uh, who make work that are you know their work i admire their work i admire them as people and just discuss their their process and and you know and a little bit about them and how they got to to where mm -hmm. they are um and i think that uh I think that I would, I, I mean, even if I was my only listener, I think that if it afforded me the opportunity to talk to people 
that I like and that uh, I am interested in their work, uh, then it's a win for me al already. But um, yeah, it's one of those things where I just I, I I because I haven't done it and because I ha I actually haven't done that many podcasts in general. Um, I don't I don't know what uh, how how effective of a of a of a podcast host I would be. It, it would be interesting, um, dude. Okay, two things. I always say two things, um, and it's like seventeen more. <laughs> and the, but that should be my that should be the name of it. Like I'm I'm the king of like renaming everything. So like yeah. I like I like I'm like oh yeah, it should have been two things. That should have been the name of my podcast. Um, I didn't know I was doing a podcast until about a year or so into it. Until, <laughs> until Josh Hood, I was talking to Josh Hood, and he goes, "Yeah, man, I listen to your podcast every week." And I'm like, "It was a vi it was on YouTube. It wasn't audio. It was." only on youtube yeah and i was like listen what do you mean and then i was like podcast like i had no idea like i just <laughs> was hanging out with friends talking comics and whatever so that's that's the the thing like do the thing that you 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 want to do if you want to do it like don't do it if you don't if you think like you, it's like I do a lot of, I do a lot of website design for, for, you know, for companies and clients. It's all different types. And they're all like, okay, cool. Yeah. And we'll, we'll get a, we're going to have a dedicated social media campaign and maybe we'll have a blog or we'll do. And I'm like, listen, don't do a thing that is just going to sit and and never be done because mm -hmm. that a not having a blog versus having a blog that hasn't been updated for seven years don't have the blog that is way more effective for you because people look at that and go like they hit the, you know because it basically just blows all sense of trust yeah so yeah. if you have like a burning desire to sit and talk to people about stuff like like this is i, I get so excited getting to talk to someone and hearing how they think about stuff because i go oh yeah that's how like or i go oh my god like you say something i'm like that is Oh shit. That's how it's, that's how you think about it. Like it's super exciting. <laughs> so, you know, these are like, you know, you're like the only person who's, you know, sort of throwing all the chips in and said, I'm going to do a 300 page graphic novel that I've, <laughs> that I've talked to. I know I've talked to people who've done all sorts of variations of that, you know, mm -hmm. but your version's different and it gets really exciting. So yeah, man. I thought you were going to try to draw like these other people. I'm like, that would be really cool. Like try to like oh. forensically break down their stuff. No, no. Um, although I did, uh, part of me was like for, um, I'm not going to do it, but for the Zoop campaign, I was thinking of maybe like uh, for one of tier to have people uh, back it. And I would do like a live, live sort of draw thing with them. Like, so mm -hmm. like kind of like, you know, how um, writers do like the script uh they go over people's scripts and kind of give them notes uh, yeah. i'd go over i could look at people's artwork and mm -hmm. uh and kind of do uh, drawovers and stuff like that um but that feels like the technical side is <laughs> i'm not a i'm not a tech guy so the idea of trying to hook up my cintiq and like cast it to something i forget about it i'm just not going to do it but I, I did think about that i was like oh you know that's actually one of the things that i feel is always missing in comics is that mentorship there's not Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of young people that are interested in drawing comics and they have no idea what they're doing. You know, you, 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 you say, Oh, you know, what, what, what format is your comic? Like that's the first thing that you should be thinking about when you're about to draw a comic book is like, well, what's, what's the scale? Like, mm -hmm. um, Oh, I, I don't know. Oh, well, are you, is it going to go all the way to the, to the sides? Like, are, do you need a bleed? What's a bleed? Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, and it does this things that, I didn't know uh, until I worked in the industry for a certain amount of time. And, yep. and it's like, cause there's no one, no one that I like the, you know, you could be in the bullpen back in the day and stuff where you could go and talk to people live and, and they can mm -hmm. look at your stuff, but that doesn't really happen anymore. And it's like, well, where, where do young people get even just the basics and get it and get it told to them correctly because there's so much misinformation online that Dude, uh, yeah you know oh oh this is how you set up your your bleeds and stuff and i'd be like well, that's not how you do it at all right. <laughs> um, so part of me was like oh i wouldn't mind trying to figure out how to do like some sort of mentorship type mm -hmm. situation but at the same time 
uh, internet it's, and it's a, it's it's an economics thing, you know, for me. Like, if, and and not talking just purely on a on, on a you know getting money factor. It's a matter of like time. Like, I went from doing this as a video thing to an audio thing because it took over an hour to upload the video from from you know the the recording to YouTube. Yeah. And I then last summer had started uh, using Substack as a, as a, as a, you know, a, a, a site. And so that was two hour long uploads. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like, I don't have the time for it. And frankly, I don't want to, like, yeah. it's just a whole thing. So I'm like, audio, it is, it's just going to be audio which of course opens up its own can of worms where now I can, I can record an intro and I can, you know, yeah. so they're, they're, they're sort of like counters to the whole thing because when it was just a live recording and I just put that up, that's what it was. But honestly, it didn't sound good. It didn't look great. So what was a benefit, <laughs> but I wanted to do for years, I wanted to do layer by layer videos with artists and like, everybody I talked to was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to do a layer by layer video with you because it would be like going through a whole page, mm -hmm. starting figuring out, not sitting there and why they do the whole thing, but you know, forensically going through the whole page. Yeah. But how much, how much time is that for me to like record this thing with another person? Let's say we, we do it in an, in an hour, but how much editing does that require on my half? Like, yeah. what is the whole thing? And I'm like, I would do it if, I had subscribers on Substack saying, Hey, here's, I don't know how much money you, people pay, $5, $7. I don't know. I have no idea. But yeah. like, if I had a hundred people paying me five bucks, you know, I would, okay, I could hire an editor to do that as a thing. But like, that's just not happening. So, you know, yeah. so the idea just sits and waits because I'm not, what am I going to do? You know, you don't, I, so I just watched, you, you did an interview with uh, Jesse Lonergan. Um, mm -hmm. I saw that on video, don't you? Yeah, that was the, that was that was when I so I stopped the beginning of this year. Oh, okay. so like I think Paul Fricky, who does uh, everyday Toth pieces, right? Yeah. Like he was the last person. I was oh, like, okay. that's it, I'm done, because yeah. I just couldn't I couldn't spend two hours plus uploading audio. You know, every Monday night, I was like, this is dumb. <laughs> Well, I, I really enjoyed the, the Jesse Lonergan one. Oh, uh, he's I mean, I, like, I could talk to Jesse every week, I think. Oh my. The, his, his, his books are just, yeah. He's, Dude. he's actually a guy that, uh, he's, I, I've talked to three individuals about being on my podcast and he's one of them. So I think I saw you, I think I saw you guys, you responded to something he said and he'd be like, I'd love to. Yeah, um, yeah. and that's when I got really mad. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but Oh man, you're gonna totally dig um, Jesse and Van's graphic novel. It is so good. Oh yeah, it is. Yeah, so that's good. Uh, Ar Arca. Ar yeah, yeah, it's so good, man. It's so good. But we're not here to talk about Jesse or <laughs> that's that's that's, Van. that's my that's my brand. Is I talk about other people and how great they are. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but so Zoop. Mm -hmm. It's happening it in is. May. May. Um, I'd have to edit that beginning part out, though. <laughs> I, I will. I won't. I won't put that in there. I'll, I'll stop. Like I'll stop right after you say it, and people yeah. will be like, "What the hell? What, what's going uh, on?" Here? Um, just put in like a whoop, like a, a little sound <laughs> oh, yeah. effect. The record scratch, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Or yeah. I'll just go. It'll be me going bleep. <laughs> That's much easier. <laughs> yeah. Um, but dude, it's 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 about to happen. This will come out. So like we're recording this and then it comes out tomorrow. So like, this is, this is going to be hot off the press. So, mm -hmm. so when people listen to this, they're going to, they're going to have to rush right over to your newsletter. Don't, don't go to the, <laughs> don't sign up at the, well, go sign up at the zoo just to get the zoo people happy. But yeah, do that after you sign up for Jason's newsletter. It's very complex because <laughs> otherwise you won't know when it happens until it happens, but you'll know what it happens ahead of time. If you go to the newsletter, did I get that right? 
Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> I, I think that the problem is, is that I just moved. Well, it's not a problem. I just moved it from to Substack. I was on Mailchimp, and I freaking hated that place. And uh, Me too. so I just moved it to to Substack, and I I don't I don't know what I'm doing. So uh, uh, <laughs> so I don't know if I need more people signing up right now because <laughs> I'm afraid of what I might I might implode the system or something. I'm, <laughs> me and Tech are so not into it. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I'll you know, link it up. The link will be in the, the description. All right. Yeah. The, the, the Zoop, uh, the, the newsletter will definitely, um, give people an advanced warning in terms of if you're not around by your computer, when the Zoop thing sends you an email, but, um, you know, their only real reason to go early is that I, I'll have a handful of commissions. I don't do commissions generally, so I'm going to do a couple. I think I said that I'd do three and, mm. um, and remarkered, uh, I, I, I don't know if we capped it yet. I think I'm going to cap that as well. So, um, so really, you know, if you're not interested in getting original art, oh, and the pages are going to be available too. So, um, and that, I think that's first come first serve in speaking in terms of the first person that backs it will get a chance to choose the pages that they want. Um, cool. Well, yeah, I haven't figured. I'm so, I have no idea what I'm doing. You better make um, up your mind. You only have like, you know, days. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, because we were like, well, maybe we'll just pick some pages and, and post them. And then I'm like, you know, I've got 308 pages here. Um, you can't post them all. So I don't know how to no. do that. Um, yeah. So really the the only positive of going and signing up for me is that you might get a couple hours advance notice. If you're not interested in any of the original art, then just go to Zoop, sign up mm -hmm. there, and you'll you'll hear about it, and you can go and and back that sort of stuff. I'm a really bad salesman. <laughs> no, listen, man, I'm 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 terrible at this, and it, it, I mean, I, I I fancy myself a good conversationalist, but I you know. I, I forget to say all the things that are, that'll make people go, Oh yeah, I should click and like, and subscribe. I don't say that. I yeah. can't remember for the life of me to say this stuff. So I, whatever, I don't care. I mean, I, mean, I really don't. I don't know. It feels like you shouldn't even have to tell people if people are enjoying it, they should just be like, Oh, I, I, I enjoyed this. I should subscribe. But you would think you would think, but yeah. Uh, when I, when I, when I, when I start doing my podcast, um, <laughs> I will never say subscribe or like. I, there you that go. is my solemn promise to any listeners. I will never say it. I say the word like a lot, but not in the right way. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, as in average, I, I say <laughs> um and like way too much uh, when I'm talking to people. But um, I, have a, I have a, I have a piece of paper here. <laughs> you know, like so that's that's me. Um, that's. Like I do that. Well, you know, every... I don't know if I say like that much. I definitely say I'm way too much, but mm. you know. That's how it goes. It's just, you know, uh, it's my inflections. That's that's me. Um what's the name of your newsletter? Just so uh just uh, in case someone is Googling. Oh, it, it's uh Jason Copeland's magical newsletter. <laughs> so Copeland doesn't have an E though. Uh so so if anyone's right just in and it goes to it's Copland. Is that how Stuart Copeland spells it? Or is he C O P E? Uh, yeah, with an E. It's okay, funny. Sorry. My son's name's Stuart. Um but, No kidding. But uh we he doesn't spell it with an E. <laughs> yeah. One of his one of his teachers like, did your parents uh name you after um after the police drummer? And drummer? he's like, What? <laughs> what? <laughs> Wait, is his middle name start with an E? No. Uh see that would have been really clever. <laughs> well yeah we're not that smart <laughs> <laughs> um wait so do you have any conventions I, I i do try to remember these kinds of things for other people not so much for myself no conventions no, he's shaking do, his head on the audio podcast jason is shaking his head no i don't do i don't do um conventions anymore i stopped tabling just prior to the pandemic and then when the pandemic ha happened it was like oh awesome i don't have to definitely don't have to do them now because i'd feel guilty right i'd be like guilty. oh i should go um, oh uh now nah, i don't do them so the only one that i really 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 still want to do and i've done it a couple years but i want to do heroes that's the only one come on out i live right up the road so oh, yeah uh uh my plan well it's too late this year um, i'm gonna email carla and i'm gonna tell her that you have to come out 
Yeah, I need them to like fly me out and put me in a hotel though, <laughs> which probably isn't going to happen. Although Full Tilt will be an eyes. I know, dude. You, year, so this um, is yeah, this is the time to do it. Yeah, it's yeah. going to be it's going to be a massive success, and um, I love this. And, I love uh, this. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to be on everyone's guest list. You can't tell you since this is audio. Once again, bringing that fact back up, you have not noticed that Jason has put on a lot of gold jewelry while we've been talking. So he uh, he is he's living the baller life right here on uh, on his he's he's getting character. Yeah, I've got high roller written on my knuckles. High yes. roller, uh, yes. Individual yeah. rings. It's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm the worst at, uh, at, at selling myself and, and my wares. So, um, so when I say that it's going to be an, uh, an Eisner nominated book, uh, it's, it's killing me just to say it. Cause I, it's not something Jeff, that I normally would Jeff say. Parker. We need you to be, to spearhead the, uh, the campaign. I tell you, man. I, yeah. That's what it's. I just need people to, to pick up that ball and run it for me. Cause I'm yeah. just not a person that does it. Yeah. I'm the worst. Oh, I hope. I hope you come out to Heroes next year. I would, I would be thrilled. Well, thank you. I, I honestly, I've done the show twice, and I, both times was fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's the only, as far as I know, it's the only large show that's all about comics. It used to yeah. be Emerald City here in in uh, Seattle until Reed Pop and those idiots bought it and turned it into one of their other mega expo blah 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 that you know where movies and video games get more more push yeah comics. i mean hey hey remember we're, we're we're preaching what we like oh edit that yeah. out uh, yeah, yeah. no it's i mean uh, we're, we're actually starting up a comic convention not we while well, i'm involved in the, the the limited capacity of answering yes and no questions uh here in Asheville, we're having the beer city comic con is uh the inaugural one will be this fall um, I think it's going to be pretty good. Like it's going to be a real fun, fun creator focused show with lots and lots of, uh, panel, panel discussions. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. th there just doesn't seem to be as enough shows that are about comic books or, or yeah. supports the comics like they should, like they can have their media stuff if they want. But I think that, um, that when, uh, when they when comic book creators just kind of get ghettoized uh, into a corner and and mm -hmm. aren't really part of their marketing or anything, um, uh, it's really disappointing. So um, yeah, so seeing seeing shows like Heroes where it's just it's about comic books like that's fantastic, and that, mm -hmm. I'd love to see more shows like that for sure. Well, it's it, you know it's I'm really going to diverge off into a tangent here, but I'm a, I, I'm a lifelong skier and I grew up in new England skied, you know, these old mountains in Vermont and, and uh, my favorite place to ski is Arapaho basin in Colorado because it feels like skiing in the seventies and early eighties in Vermont. So I, I, that's, and that's what heroes feels like. It feels like going to comic conventions in the eighties and the nineties. Yeah. I don't know. Just the, the hero guest list is always fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, people, all the, all the creators are, are like super generous with their time. Like when I used to go the few times that I went, I could sit and I could talk to people like Toby Cypress. I would just stand and chat and watch them draw. And um, yeah. And you just get a chance to make those connections with, with the artists that are, that I think that are making important work and yeah. the, I don't see them in Vancouver. I don't see them in even totally. Seattle. Like they just, they don't, the hero seems to be the, the, the place that they all flock to. So um, it's, the, yeah. it really is. It's great. Um, so, well, you'll have a big stack of uh, <laughs> uh, full tilts next year with the Eisner awards sticker on it. I don't know. The the my plan is to not to have a whole lot of overstock. So, <laughs> hey man, that's what reprints are for. You just reprint, have a big crate delivered there to Charlotte, and and just yeah. fly home in your gold helicopter. Yeah, that's how it goes. Gonna, it's going to be insane. The 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 money that I'm going to make on this hand over mm. fist. <laughs> it's it's great. The kickback you throw to all these podcasters. It's going to oh, be yeah, I know. fantastic. It, that's, that's, that's the make or break right there. That's, that's how I'm going to push through to the, the, the really big sales. Is, is, uh... <laughs> oh, this is beautiful. I love it. Um, 
dude i really really appreciate you coming and talking because oh, it's it's I appreciate a you taking the time for sure yeah i i, I I'm, I'm really excited the artwork by the way there's a i don't know if it's intentional but there's a phenomenal uh apple seed kind of vibe going on with a lot of your armored cops so, oh yeah not intentional um, it's it's but it's i, can, I that, can see what you're saying that i think yeah that. Yeah, it's got that beautiful, it's got that beautiful tonal quality with that very aggressive sort of render line, which just puts so much energy in there. So I love it. <laughs> I'm all about the energy. <laughs> yeah, I can tell. Um, Jason, thanks, man. And oh, um, yeah, my pleasure. Good luck, Zoop. It's going to be big. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and uh, I guess we'll, we'll talk, to, I guess we'll, we'll talk next year. In yeah, at Heroes. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you stop, man. Thanks.